And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And an angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Very interesting words. This is the third week of Advent that we're doing, and this third candle represents the joy that the birth of Jesus brought to the world, or at least the offer of it, to all of us watching this. That's what this week is about. Really, as we're going to discover, that's what our whole lives are about, the quest for joy. So the text this week is Luke chapter 2, where the angels come to the shepherds and tell them not to fear, which is kind of interesting because what must angels look like if every time they show up in the Bible, they have to tell people looking at them not to be afraid? That's how huge, glorious, majestic they are. Shield your eyes. It's unreal. This isn't some sideshow subplot to what Christmas is about either. This is a central part of the Christmas story. Every year around the Western world at Christmas, pageants, thousands of kids put on bathrobes to act out the part of the shepherds, right? Every year, my elementary school would gather together and we'd have our bathrobes on and we'd be kind of backstage and our parents would be out there and we'd all be whispering, hasca, 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 and we'd go out and be like, look at the angel. And then the angel would be like, fear not. And be some kid like, man, the principal would, you know, that's how it was. We associate the Christmas story with that reality, with the shepherds. But the question is, what are they doing there? What are they doing in this story? We think, well, it's fluffy, it's sheep, it's sentimental, but that's not why they're there. Luke is trying to teach us something. He's going to teach us a bunch of things. The first thing he's trying to teach us is about grace. You know what grace is? Grace is the fact that God is so good, he uses sinners like us. Now, I know that's a mean word, sinner, but suck it up. It's what the Bible calls you, right? Dallas Willard, who was this writer and philosopher back in the day, he said that we tend to be okay with saying that we sin, but we don't like to be called sinners. We may lie, but we aren't liars in our mind. I was watching a show the other day, this week, and the guy was kind of calling out a guy for parking his car in a ter- like he went over the line. And he's like, uh, you know, you're a terrible person with your parking. And the guy's like, are you calling me a terrible person? And he's like, no, I'm calling you a terrible person with your parking. See, this is different. It's the one thing, but it doesn't mean the holistic reality. See, this offends us, but the Bible comes out and says we are by definition sinful by nature and choice. The test of this, if you want to wonder if this is you, when you woke up this morning, who did you think about first? right? Yourself, not God, not your friends, not your spouse, you. And when you look in the old photos and you're going through the classmates and you see, who do you look for? Your eyes scan around. You're looking for you. It's in our bones. We are about us. And yet God comes for us. Yet God loves us in spite of us, not because of us. He uses us to do cool stuff in the world, even though we don't really deserve to be used. How wacky is that? So he could just use the best of us. He could use the holy people. He could use the righteous people, but he doesn't. He uses the normal everyday us. That's who the shepherds were. They were scoundrels. They were liars. They were thieves. They they had like this dirty job. And the fact that Luke tells us they were the ones who were on the night watch makes them even worse. So these guys are the worst of the worst. That's who shepherds were. They weren't like these people that people looked at and said, oh, I wish I could be a shepherd. They were like dirty people who weren't trusted. Christmas says no matter who you are, what you've done, what you're doing right now, God wants to use you. Not when you get all cleaned up and perfect, but now, right after this sermon, you could change the direction of your life. Great things are done, not because we're great, but because he's great. He will use anyone. Grace literally means undeserved favor, and we aren't used to that. That's the opposite to the classic stories of Christmas, where Santa brings gifts to good boys and girls and coal to those on the naughty list. You've probably heard that before, but that isn't Christianity. See, Christianity is about grace. It's not about making bad people good, but dead people live. And that's the beauty of it. Now, this is really hard for religious people to grab a hold of or to really believe. You have to be this good or that good to go to heaven when you die, religious people say. Christmas and Christianity come along and say, no, no, to be saved 
you got to throw yourself on the grace of God. You got to recognize no matter who you are, no matter who you think you are, and then the life begins. And that's different. You begin to walk with Jesus and you get joyous, but at times it can be hard. Harder than if you didn't choose to walk with Jesus. If you're honest, these shepherds would have gone back to among their community of thieves and robbers and gone, I had a experience with the living God and I want to change my ways. Maybe friends will mock you depending on your age or your stage of life. And now you got to start killing sin. You got to start running from temptation. See, in some way, the Christian life ends up being a little harder sometimes than it was before we met Jesus. I saw a picture this week. It was like a meme of... Uh, Two pictures of Leonardo DiCaprio, right? So Leo, he was on the front of the Titanic, you know, that shot where, I'm the king of the world. And he's kind of on the front, like doing this. And underneath it, it said conversion, right? Like, this is how it feels when you have that first encounter with God, it's conversion time. And then the next shot was a picture of Leo in the Revenant. And he's all like bearded up and he's got like scars all over his face. His lips are all dry. And it says sanctification underneath, meaning like, this is the lifelong process of actually following Jesus. Moments of great, I, I encountered God, I want to change my life. And then the life starts where we actually follow him. And at times it can be hard, but it starts with us coming to the end of ourselves and saying, I'm not the angels in the story of Christmas. I'm not, I'm not Jesus in the story of Christmas. I'm not even Mary and Joseph. I'm the shepherds. I'm, I'm tired and undeserving of God to speak to me, but he does it anyway. And once that move is made in your life, what is the result? That's what this week is all about. Joy comes. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy. I'm not sure we always catch that. Later in the story, the shepherds actually, it says they return glorified and praising God for all they had heard and seen. Hold on to those verses. Glorifying and praising God. These guys are jacked. They're excited about what this means. If Christmas is true, they're going, oh my goodness, ah! Like, like some of you, you should be waking up in the morning just going, oh my goodness, I can't believe I know God. But you need to see, I look at some of you, and I'm not trying to be offensive, but you need to tell your face that you follow Jesus. Because you're a bore, right? You're a complainer. You're miserable. That's not what Christianity is. It bubbles up inside of us and spills out to everyone around us, glorifying and praising God. They went around telling everybody, this is what Christianity creates. So let's talk about joy. They're jacked up. They're having fun with this thing. They're smiling, even though life is hard around them. There's pain, there's hardship, there's temptation, there's disappointment. They found something to be joyous about. See, Luke tells us that in verse 17, later in Luke 2, he says that they went and spread the word. See, you don't spread the word about a thing that you aren't joyous about. I remember when I first met Erin, uh, we started dating and none of my friends had met her, but I wanted my friends to meet her because I was jacked up about it. And so she was beautiful and smart and funny, but you know, I didn't want to look like, make, like make it obvious that I was that excited. So I called my buddy up, I'm like, hey, meet me in the back path. I'll bring her back there for a walk and we can pretend that we just bumped into you. All right. So Aaron and I are walking in the back path, just, you know, just getting to know each other. Oh, there's my best friend, Rob. Well, hello, Rob. I didn't know you'd be in the back path today. Well, hello, Mark. Well, this is Aaron. Hi, Aaron. Nice to meet you. Hey, bro. See, see, that's me spreading the word. I'm, I'm excited. That's what you do when you're excited. She created joy in me. So, so what... That's what Christianity did in the lives of these guys. Does it for you? Well, you've met the God of the universe and you're so excited about it that you want to spread the word. See, when we take that light into our lives, what can happen other than joy? When you stand near a fountain, what happens other than you get wet? That's the default if you really stand there, if you're really close to it. See, this is so good because that means Christianity is the answer to our deepest need and want and desire in life. You know what the number one thing in all of our lives, everyone watching this right now, everyone sitting around you right now, you know what the number one need and desire in all of our lives is? Everything we do is to find happiness and joy in our life. That's it. That's, that's why we have the 
girlfriend that we have. That's why we chose the boyfriend that we have or the spouse or the food that we eat or whether we work out or whether we don't work out, what we read, whether we stare up at the stars, why we study something in school, why we write, why we... It's all about happiness. St. Augustine said, all who use their brains desire to be happy. It's the foundation of all philosophy. It's what all modern psychology is about. That's what the self-help books are about. You go to a bookstore. I went to the bookstore the other day to the self-help section. Happiness hypothesis, happiness formula, history of happiness, all bestsellers. Why? What are they all about in the end? Soul happiness, flourishing, fulfillment. And what's interesting is there's a best-selling uh, book called Sapien by Yuval Noah Harari. And what he talks about is 2.5 million years of human development. And he kind of takes us through it. And he brings all of that, hundreds and hundreds of pages, down to two specific points about our development as humankind over 2.5 million years, he says. One is about the future of our species, like where we're going. And two, he says, is the question of our happiness. That's what we're all searching for. One writer's biography that I read is called Surprise by Joy, meaning I, I went through my whole life and I was going through all this pain and I had this one moment of joy when I was a kid, and then I spent the rest of my life searching for it, and I found it in Jesus. That's where he ends up going in his life, when he's like 40, 50 years old. See, Christmas is exactly this offer to the world. You want joy? It's the thing you've been looking for your whole life? You want satisfaction? You want fulfillment? It can only be found in Christ. That's the point. So Harari says this, the last 500 years have witnessed a breathtaking series of revolutions and improvements to the earth, the economy, science, industry, politics, daily life, psychology. But are we happier, he says. Was Neil Armstrong, he says, happier, whose footprint remains intact on the windless moon than the nameless hunter-gatherer who 30,000 years ago left her handprint on a wall in a cave? And he answers, no, we're not happier because... Happiness isn't measured by a metric of economics or health or things, but around meaning. And we have less of that now than we did then. And this is what Christianity offers. Joy through meaning. Feeling fulfillment through meaning. Often we don't think like that. Christianity and happiness, that they're all connected, that they're even cousins, but they are. The Christian life is an offer of happiness, of joy. See, years ago... There's this Christian book I read, it changed my life. The subtitle was Reflections of a Christian Hedonism. All right, so meaning hedonism is like, like a quest for pleasure. And what the writer was saying is it's totally okay to live for pleasure. Why would you live for anything else? We can't, we weren't made to. And he said, it's dumb and arrogant to try to worship God for any other reason than the pleasure of it, to be had and to be experienced in him. So. What are, you, what are you doing it for? Why are you worshiping God? Why did you become a Christian? To get out of hell? To get your sins forgiven? No, no. To get the greater joy that God gives. That's what we miss. See, God wants us happy. Jesus wants us to know joy. John 15 says this, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Question is, where to truly find it? That's the battle every day. And we fail when we look to the world rather than God for that joy. That's the whole message of the Bible. So C.S. Lewis, in his sermon, The Weight of Glory, he says this, if there lurks in most modern minds the notion that to desire our own good and earnestly to hope for the enjoyment of it is a bad thing, I had submit that this notion has no part of the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the gospels, it would seem that our Lord, listen to this, finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go making mud pies in a slum, because he cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. What is Lewis saying? Our mistake is not that we have a desire for pleasure. It's that that desire is too weak. We settle for stuff 
rather than God. And that's a dumb trade. It's like saying, I want to give up amazing food made with love and care and nutritious and, 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 and made over time. And I want to trade that out for fast food because it tastes good for the five minutes I'm eating it. But in reality, behind the curtain, when it's all said and done, one is better than the other. You've seen that picture of the little girl who has like her little stuffed bear and she doesn't want to hand it over to Jesus and he's sitting there trying to ask for it, but behind him, he has this massive bear, like 10 times the size, but she doesn't necessarily know that. That's what we're like. We're not sure Jesus is going to give us the joy, so we hold back. We don't get fully in. See, that never tends to occur to us. And yet the Bible says, Psalm chapter 37, verse four, delight yourself in the Lord. Jesus said, that when we finally orient our lives around God, we're like a man finding treasure hidden in a field, he says in the book of Matthew. And then what happens next in that parable? He says, he goes to the field, he covers it up, and then in his joy, the man goes and sells all that he has and buys that field because he found that treasure. See, when we find something more valuable than anything else this world has to offer, the wisest course of action is to do whatever it takes to keep it because it's going to bring us, what's the key word there? Joy. In his joy, he went and sold everything so he could buy the field. So why can he sell everything and be happy about it? Because he realizes he sold all that stuff for something better. There's no other way to triumph over sin long term than to gain a distaste for it because of a superior satisfaction in God. Joy isn't a side plot. It's what our whole lives end up being about in the end. Joy in him and not in the world. Not in money, not in family, not in beauty, not in, not, not in, not in, not in, not, 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 that, 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 that. When you actually don't just believe, but you treasure. You don't just obey out of duty, but love and cherish him and be jolly in it. That's when it's different. Basically, it's when we look inside of ourselves and to those around us that we aren't happy, right? George MacDonald once said, the one principle of hell is... I am my own. So the Bible wants to say it's not a bad thing to desire our own good. Our problem is we're just looking at the wrong things. We stop too early instead of the God behind the thing. So this is where Christianity goes in our lives. It's not just about Jesus. It's about us, which is why the New Testament is constantly on about the result of Christmas being true. The result of the cross and the resurrection, the ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit being true in our lives. It's what the whole New Testament goes on about. That if what happened in the Gospels is true, now let me give you 25 books about what it means for you. Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's the second one? Joy. Meaning we've been wrong then to say for an action to be virtuous or good, the agent must not get any personal benefit in it. That's what Immanuel Kant, the philosopher years ago said. That is false. We do get a benefit, a huge one. We get God. We get the rewards that God offers us. We get pleasures forevermore. We get a new life. We get transformation. See, Jesus is the philosopher of happiness. That's why the Sermon on the Mount starts, blessed is the one who is, blessed is the one. That's the word happy, McElroy, happy. See, Sermon on the Mount starts with that and the whole thing is answering that question. That's how you get happiness. That's why it goes on and on about, don't go after money. This is how to deal with lust. Here's how to do re retaliation. All of it will leave you empty. Blessed is the one, happy is the one. So how do we get this joy then? I love this story. It says, first, what the angels heard. They hear the angels' message. So much of what Christmas has to teach us has to do with what we hear, right? Like, one of my big issues in my marriage, how often my wife looks at me and goes, uh, I already told you that. Weren't you listening? And of course, the answer, every time she says that is yes and no, of course, I was, but I kind of wasn't. I heard, but I didn't hear. Meaning I didn't let it sink in. 
Christmas challenges us to spiritually hear what's going on because here's the reality of every single one of our lives. God speaks, yeah, but sin speaks and the world around you speaks. And the question is, do you bother listening and hearing him above the things or do you just carry on with life? That's the danger, to hear and yet not hear, right? Uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones years ago said these haunting words, You can be innocent of all gross sins and yet be guilty of this terrible thing, of being satisfied with your life, of having pride in your achievements and of looking down on others. See, this is the crazy thing. Not only am I doing this crazy thing or that, it's being satisfied with our lives. That's what we wake up in the morning every day and and work to accomplish with all our strength and all our heart the one thing that could keep us from God, build a better life, be comfortable, and then we can't hear him. These guys heard though, and it changed everything. The other angle that hit me this week is, remember I said these guys were thieves and they were dirty, they had a mess of a life. They show up to Mary and Joseph And they say, here's what the angels talk to us about. And here's what you should do about it. Now imagine what what you would do. These guys are dirty. They're they're all tattered up. They're they're, they're swearing a little too much. I mean, these guys show up on your front door and pound on the door and go, we got a message for you, all right? And they're all messed up. They're like twerking around. And you're like, huh. And then the text says, Mary treasured up all the stuff they said in her heart. It's so powerful. That they actually believe. Mary and Joseph believe these guys. You know what it says? Listen to me. Here's the scary part. For those of you kind of hearing but not hearing, Christmas, speak to you. Listen. It says that our instincts can be wrong sometimes. They can be shallow. They can be misguided. The way they take in data, what they conclude can be dead wrong, right? When we're looking at someone and they're all tattered up and they're dirty and they're thieves and they're not the people we would want to listen to and yet they're speaking truth and Mary receives what they say. See, sometimes we gotta go, man, my instinct here, what I'm feeling, what I'm looking at aesthetically, it's not right. I can't trust it. Um, I remember reading the story about Van Halen, the band, and uh, in their rider, which is like the thing that you have to write up every city that you go to, You would arrive, let's say, in Seattle to do a show and all the people would be there and they'd be setting up all the lights and the staging and all of that. And of course, you'd have this back room for the band. And and, and the, the lead singer famously had this list of stuff that he needed in the back room. And one of the things he said is, I want a bowl of M&Ms, but there can't be any brown ones. I want all the brown M&Ms taken out. And everyone always kind of viewed that as like, oh, he's so, you know, uh, he's just so high and mighty and uh, elitism. He doesn't like brown M&Ms. I can't believe it. And that's how for years and years and years people read the data. But the problem is they were dead wrong. That the reason he said that was because it was the only way that he knew that that city, that the people setting up all that equipment had actually read the entire rider because the rider was like 50 pages long. And it's the only way he could guarantee safety for the crew. Because if they didn't set up the lights and all the speakers properly, something would fall apart. But all of that was in the manual, all was in the water. And how am I gonna know they read the rider? Well, the last thing I'll put in it is that all the brown M&Ms need to be taken out. See, sometimes you're not as smart as you think. You misread the data. We have to distrust our senses sometimes. That's what's scary. We take in information, but we get it dead wrong. And this Christmas story says the fundamental mistake we make is joy comes as a result, not of going after joy, but in getting God. Jesus tells us the secret to happiness, and we have it all wrong. We go after this and this and this and this and fame and adventure and beauty and whatever relationships. And yet, how does, what does he teach? He he says, happy are the ones who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Notice, not happy are the ones going after happiness. See, in a philosophy of religion that has stood the test of time, it's a result of going after righteousness 
versus going after happiness. Happiness is not a thing in itself. Joy is not a thing in itself. It's downstream. One writer has said, do not seek thrills, seek righteousness. Go after holiness and righteousness. Go after, I want to be like my Lord, to live in this world as he lived, to walk as he walked. Seek for happiness and you'll never find it. Seek righteousness and you will discover you are happy. Let me end by reflecting on something we probably never reflect on or very often. Not our happiness for just a second, but Jesus' own happiness. See, something I can almost guarantee is that you haven't really thought about Jesus' own happiness in a while. Notice exactly what he said in John 15, that my joy may be in you. See, Jesus has joy too. Hebrews chapter 12 says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What makes Jesus have joy? Thomas Goodwin, who's this old theologian, said, his own joy, comfort, happiness, and glory are increased and enlarged by what? Our foibles and mistakes and failures. Because his joy is increased by what he accomplished on the cross for us. Every time the grace has to be applied more and more. The mercy, the pardoning, the comforting of his people here on earth. That's what gives him joy. We tend to view him as like, oh, he's mad at us. It's like increasing and enlarging the grace. This is what Paul talks about. Where there was sin, grace increased all the more. Picture a doctor flies into a jungle. He's put in all this work. He's brought all this equipment and he's sitting waiting to help all these people in the village, but no one shows up. There's a sadness there, but then people start showing up. And what does he feel for all the work and effort he's put into it? What does he feel? Joy. His joy increases to the degree that the sick come to him for help. See, it's the whole reason that doctor came in the first place. Christ gets more joy and comfort than we do when we come to him for help and throw ourselves on his mercy, so Goodwin says, the glory and happiness and joy of Christ are enlarged and increased as his members come to him to have the purchase of his death more and more laid upon them. Then he comes to see the fruit of his labor. See, Jesus isn't drained when we need him, y'all. He lives for this. This is what he loves to do. This is what gets him up in the morning. This is why he came and gave his life as a ransom for many. Receive it. Receive it and be joyous. And in that, give him joy. I will end by reading a poem as I've been ending all these weeks. It's a short poem by William Blake. It says this. He who binds himself to joy does the winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise.